all of a sudden this guy started moving at the end of the village, moving inland. Then the next minute all of the ice um, just moving on top of the community, pushing all the houses against the uh, bushes. We dressed up the kids and we threw in some coats and stuff in the boat and some food, wood. And then just as we were doing that, we could see the ice coming and there was a little shack down the river. That little shack just started lifting up and it came floating with the ice. It looked really scary. My mother was screaming. She just kept saying, my mother, my mother in Cree. May 1986. A torrent of ice and water devastated this tiny village, Winisk in northern Ontario. It was home to the Winisk Cree Indian Band. This is their story. It's about them, their land, and their struggle to build a new home. was the flood they'd always been terrified of. Spring breakup along northern rivers always brings high water, but this flood was a killer. Two people died in those icy waters. There used to be 70 buildings here. After the Winisk River flooded, there were five. Linda Hunter's just 14 years old. She was at home, babysitting. I was drying dishes in the first place, inside my house right behind us. And Mabel was making tea, and all of a sudden Christopher came rushing to the house and said there was a two, two story, of, two story of ice chunk, chunks of ice coming forward. I didn't believe him at first, but then when I looked up, when I looked out from our door, I saw it coming too. I grabbed most of my my little sister. And I threw her in the boat while, while my my brothers and my cousins were dragging out the, the blankets into a larger boat. We only, we had three boats that time. Well, I well my mom ran up ran up the road a little bit when my mom when the hell when a pole near, nearly fell on her. She was about to go under a boat. When I got off the boat again and how jumped in the water and how grabbed her by the neck here. It's what saved her from dying. It's all in a panic. Luke Gal, where are we sitting right now? Well we're sitting where my house used to be. This is uh, the foundation. I know the ice just picked up the house and moved in line. I thought that I just lost my kids and I don't I don't even know where they were inside or inside the house. So I figured uh, I had lost them. I didn't see my kids for until nine o'clock that evening again, when the other cars had started picking up people. Where'd you see them, Luke? I saw them at the airport again. And what did you think had become of them? I thought they were dead. I thought my parents were dead, my relatives, my sisters. 
I thought everybody was dead on this end. The next morning I came back here and I walked into my house, picked up a few things. As I came out, something came over me that just felt bitter. That I had lost everything. I just dropped everything on the door, doorstep. What does Piwanek mean to you, Lud? Well, it's a new hometown for me. New hometown for the Winds Glen. I'm really looking forward to getting a new house. Luke Gull's new home is at Piwanek. It's 30 kilometers upriver from Winesk. It's a handsome site for a new village. There are 175 people in the Winesk band, and they made the move to Piwanek in June. At first, they lived in tents on the riverbank. By July, they'd started building their houses. There's an irony there. The Winnis people had been lobbying to leave for close to 20 years. They knew the old village was likely to get flooded. Band members even wore buttons that read, Piwanek, the promised land. Within weeks of the 1986 flood, government agreed to pay for the move. By July, there were already helicopters flying in building materials. For Chief George Hunter and his people, Piwanek holds special meaning. In the olden days, we had people come up to uh, Piwanek uh, to, uh, to collect flint, uh, as Piwanek means in Cree, uh, flint. We did site selection studies, you know, the possible six sites, and we've always chosen Piwanek as the number one site. And it's been over 20 years, and I think uh, we may have gone, I don't know, maybe uh, close to uh, uh, ten, over 10 chiefs, maybe. Uh, like, I've been working and pursuing the, the relocation uh, issue for the last six years. George Hunter and his council, the elected officials, masterminded this move. The 28-year-old Hunter was achieving a goal that had eluded other chiefs for a generation. The finances uh, <clears throat> that were required were never there. We uh, did a lot of studies and, you know, we met all the requirements that the bureaucrats wanted us to do. and. We went through all their processes and they never came up with the money. And, and that was the, the, the whole thing that, uh, that, that held up relocation. The determination that built Piwanek was partly fueled by anger. Anger over what it took to get a bureaucracy to act. Well, it's kind of disheartening, you know, when you have to lose two people to make it happen. Uh, I think we did our part. Uh, to move, did all the work, we met all the red tape requirements that the government wanted us to do. And, you know, it's really disheartening to finally get the government to assist us financially. So it has always been the financial question to, uh, to make relocation a reality. And, you know, having, having have lost uh, uh, two people, you know, it's, it's, it's really, you know, really something that's not acceptable to a lot of us in the community to finally get the government to assist uh, or to finance this, this relocation that we're having today. Piwanek is a good home for the Winnis Cree. The river banks here are high. It's safe from flood. The river rapids teem with fish. It's the kind of place suited for a village, much better than the sites Bands like the Winnis Cree received in treaty negotiations. That's not lost on Brian Faraday, a civil engineer. He's been the Winnis people's southern consultant for the relocation. Well, it's opened my eyes. Uh, there's, number one, there's nothing to stop any community moving. Northern Ontario, you. Everywhere you look, Indian reserves are located in just atrocious sites uh, where the Europeans decided they should live when they signed the treaties. Uh, you, you look at uh, 
some of the swamp land and some of the areas that bands have been given. You look at the flooding problems. Piwanak, uh, Winnesk Band isn't the only one that's had these problems. Fort Severn's been washed out, Fort Albany, Moose Factory. All these reserves are in very, very poor sites. And uh, this project has shown that there's no reason why a community can't move, can't move to a site that it wants. For thousands of years, the Winniskri lived in small family groups in the bush. They're relative newcomers to village life. That began around the turn of the century. Hudson Bay traders started to frequent Winnisk and other bay posts. By Ontario standards, the Winnisk Cree are extremely isolated. They didn't sign a treaty until 1930. Band elder Nancy Patrick was there. She's in her 70s now. When the treaty commissioner came calling, she was a young bride. Winnisk was small then. There were no houses, just a store and a church. People went to their trap lines to survive. They lived in the bush in winter. In the summer, they would return to Winnisk. In 1930, only a few families lived at Winnisk. But slowly, more of them were drawn to the village. For the devout, like Nancy Patrick, the arrival of an oblate missionary was decisive. A short while after I moved there, a priest came to reside. There was no priest before that. They only came periodically for short visits. Another force that persuaded people to settle at Winnisk was the military. It was the 1950s. The Winnisk Cree became unlikely partners in the Cold War. Radar bases were constructed across the north. One was put right across the Winnisk River from the village. For a while, the base provided jobs for the people, but it soon became obsolete. The base shut down in 1965. All that's left are these dilapidated buildings. Life was hectic in the summer of 86, but it was nothing the Winnis Cree couldn't handle. They'd been waiting 20 years for this opportunity. They weren't about to blow it. Many adults worked 18 hours a day. Even so, village life continued in the tent city. People kept up with their chores, cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry, drawing the odd caribou hide. It was a summer full of expectation. People were eager to see the new homes completed. I cry in my heart every time I come here. I haven't been able to come home yet. I no longer like staying at the old folks' home. Since I can't come home, I have heartaches. I can't see my grandchildren because I'm away. I'm nearing my time to die because of my old age. Work proceeded at a feverish pace throughout the summer. It was 16 hours a day, seven days a week, right until autumn. Helicopters bringing in supplies could barely keep up. Workers from neighboring Indian communities came to help. So did a southern crew. Specialists arrived to work on a diesel powered electrical system, drill wells, and begin work on an airstrip.
wanted to build the houses before Christmas. They were determined to have families out of the tents before winter. You have to realize winter in Pewanik means 30 below starting in November. It's a tight schedule by anyone's standard. Morris Mack, band's assistant project manager, had his doubts. Well, we kind of figured we couldn't do it. We were selected to do 15 houses. Then, as we progressed a little further, we went faster, so we, we decided to take on the other 15. So a total of uh, 30 houses to build for the local band, plus the extra labor we have to get from the outside. The new homes will be sturdy compared to those on most northern reserves. There's deep soil if you want. That allows basements. You couldn't have had those on the muskeg at Winnis. For one thing, we got foundations, and it means more house. And um, another thing is, uh, they'll be solid and not compared to uh, the, the ones in the old side. They, every time there was a permafrost, they move and shift around. So as far as these are concerned, they're a lot better. The Winnis Cree learned a lot of new stuff that summer. This girl climbed on the backhoe one day after a little training, the job was hers for the summer. One tent was set up for a kitchen. Workers and their families arrived in shifts to eat. Mennonite volunteers like May and Morgan Bear helped out. I came about 10 days ago and we plan to be here for another 20 days. In the morning, I get up about half past five, quarter to six, and we prepare uh, bacon for about 20 to 25 men, and uh, fry, poach, scrambled eggs, make toast, and have hot cup of coffee available at all times. Well, one thing that's very particular and outstanding in my opinion is that there is absolutely no plumbing. No hot water on tap. We carry the water in, we carry the water out, and uh, hopefully we don't have to climb down the well to get it. <laughs> I wish I could stay here longer. How come? I enjoy the people. They're, they're cheerful, they're cooperative, and appreciative. Building in the north costs a lot of money. The price of transportation sees to that. This project is worth about $10 million just to complete the houses. Chief George Hunter says he's not embarrassed about that. What do you say to those people who say it's not justified, that uh, these people are getting too much? Well, I think um, <clears throat> there are always a lot of people uh, speculating that uh, a small band is getting too much, but I think at the same time we've always been uh, informing the the the, the governments, uh, both province and 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 feds, that since even 20 years ago when we started, you know, this could have been less than what it's costing them now. Uh, we've told them that if we still battle this out even mid-80s or right up to the 1990s, it's just going to cost more, and that's exactly what's happening. We took time during our summer visit to check out the surrounding territory. To a southerner, the Hudson Bay coast might appear a wasteland. It's actually full of life. Home to the whistling swan.
And in the bay itself, there are beluga whales. The Cree don't hunt them. They're Inuit food. But the Winnis Cree do rely on most of the local animals. They're the center of a way of life. Here's Dominic Hunter, a young band member. It offers a lot of freedom, distance. It's uh, one of my greatest pastimes has been uh, hiking and just playing, just romping around the land, you know. And I know just about every scrange of this area, about uh, from the James Bay right up to Severn and as far as 150 miles inland. And it's a nice country, it has a lot to offer. Anything from um, wildlife to trees to uh, maybe, miner maybe even minerals and stuff. They don't call part of this territory Polar Bear Provincial Park for nothing. Some of these beasts weigh 600 pounds. The Cree hunt them under strict limits that the band enforces. This is an old rifle my dad bought in 1969 and somewhere. And um, I've used it in just about everything. What it's kind of a, rifle is it? It's a Remington Model 788 in the 30-30 caliber. And uh, they don't make them anymore. <laughs> and. I uh, altered it quite a bit. Like, I, there used to be a comb on here and free floated the barrel, lightened the trigger, and put a scope on it, which used to have iron sights in. And I shot everything from it, from the smallest uh, ptarmigan right up to polar bear. Even with the construction going on, people were yearning to get back on the land. It means food on the table and cash from running hunting and fishing camps for Southerners. A lot of food was lost in the flood. This was Daniel Kustachin's summer home. Uh, right now we don't have much uh, food for, uh, for wild meat, eh? So, because to, maybe in the spring, in the spring, when you get in, next spring, you're going to get uh, geese like that and uh, fish. You have to put them in the freezer for uh, during the summer. But in the spring, we got lots of geese. Everybody was uh, putting geese in the freezer. And we get a flood, you get, everything's gone. That relationship with the land is the mainstay of the local economy. These more or less traditional activities combine with construction, service, or band administration jobs to help keep the Winnis Cree independent. What makes me proud of this community is that only five people are on welfare recipients. You know, they're wealth, welfare recipients. And usually only five people and out of, uh, out of, uh, out of 170 people. And somehow... <clears throat> uh, they blend, I guess, uh, the things that they get from trapping, hunting, and fishing, and you know, the mixed economy that, that, that comes out of this, somehow they, uh, they make it through a year. What can they do? Give me a, a sense of what, what's available out there. What, what, when you talk about a mixed economy, what can they get from the land to sustain themselves? Well, <clears throat> for instance, with trapping, you know, obviously you... you there's a whole variety of, of pelts, anywhere from polar bear pelt to beaver and so on. And, and um, when people start using uh, beaver, for example, as food, you know, it doesn't cost them anything to, or doesn't allow them to run to, to the store or something to get food. And, you know, they get the food from, from, from out there, like uh, caribou. Uh, some people average over 20 caribou a year uh, per individual. And that's, that's a lot of meat right there. And, and the women make uh, clothing uh, or uh, handicrafts out, out of the of the heights that they make. So, you know, that, that's the type of thing that they exercise in, in order to have uh, uh, their family in, income stable.
That reliance on the land, fishing, hunting, and trapping, makes the Winniscree socially strong too. It's a social piece that's been lost on some northern reserves to alcoholism, joblessness, and despair. Not here. The reason why we're socially stable is because of our intelligence. I think we're, we're more intelligent than those communities that have those kind of social problems. Like they have gas sniffing problems, they have a, a marriage problems because of alcohol and those kind of things. And when we look at our history, like the community, I think Winesk has been together for the last 30 years. And, and in the 30 years, we always like to say that we only had one shooting, accidental uh, shooting, I guess, from alcohol. Uh, maybe, I think, 10 uh, experimental gas sniffing that people admitted the last 30 years. And we've never had anybody taken out uh, 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 for treatment or go to rehabilitation centers for uh, for uh, alcoholism or, or, or abusing uh, uh, sniffing agents, you know, and, and th that's, that's what's really strong about this community. It really keeps them together. And, you know, when, when you hear about other things in other Indian communities or any other community, I think it's basically the people are intelligent enough not to get into those things. And they train their children not to get into those things. And that really makes me proud. We returned to Pewanik in December. The transformation was amazing. The houses were completed ahead of schedule. And families had moved out of their tents in minus 30 degree temperatures to insulated, wood heated homes. Susan Bird is a single mother. She's a teacher's aide in a local school. She and her kids were glad to be out of a drafty tent. While living in a tent, Susan looked for wood almost every day. To heat this new house, she only had to make one trip a week. A lot had happened to Susan and her kids since the ice pummeled their home at Winisk. But Susan hadn't forgotten the flood, neither had her kids. They still remembered they would always talk about the ice or any noise they hear, they would say that ice is coming. They remember seeing the ice when we were in the boat. When they see the river, they say, there, is there going to be a flood here? And I have to keep telling them that there, there's no flood here. What do you think of this site for the village? Do you, want, do you like it here, this spot? Yeah, it's nice. Looks better than Winnisk. <laughs> Life was getting back to normal. Mike Hunter had time to build a new sleigh, or tabernacle, to use the Cree word. These things are used for almost everything in the winter around here, from going to church to hauling supplies on long hunting trips. What happened in this last spring is that we uh, lost everything that's what we had. And with the sleigh that I'm making right now, it last me at least Five to ten years. So, you know, the only thing I got to change every now and then, I guess, would be the runners, because they'd be worn out in about two years' time. And uh, I guess the box, you know, the new box for the Bible, what's required every year. By December, the Pewanic airstrip had been completed. Two or three flights a week bring in visitors, construction supplies, and goods for the local store. A temporary store was set up in one of the new houses. Prices are high. 
gas goes for seven dollars a gallon and the limited selection of food is at least twice the southern price. The return to normal life means that men like Daniel Pistachio can get back on the land. Daniel was able to resume trapping. Came for wood and then I saw uh, fresh tracks, for fox traps, so I thought I am going to get that animal for, uh, to use it on a meat, on a service like that. Tissue paper over top. Why do you do that? Well, let's look what it done. If we just put uh, snow on it to cover it with the snow, that won't do any good. So I have to put a soft snow there just to hold the paper not to blow away. If it's coming, if it's windy today, I got it, see? The uh, fresh snow is good, it's better than put it uh, like this. Not much, just a little bit. Might come back in two days and get a fox. A winter's dawn on the Winisk River, the hour hunters often choose to set out for caribou. Abraham Chukamolan and Alfred Matak have traveled some 25 kilometers from Pewanik. It's 45 below zero. These hunting trips often last three or four days. The hunters take a bit of food, a tent, sleeping bags, and sometimes a small wood stove. Late in the day, Abraham and Albert find some tracks. This would normally mean the start of hours of carefully tracking the caribou by skidoo, then on foot. Fortunately for us, the hunters relent on this day. They quit the hunt and light a fire in next to no time. You quickly realize how fast these people work in these temperatures. It's essential for survival. In the winter of 1986, caribou were plentiful near Piwana. Their ready supply of food for capable hunters like Alfred Matak. Back in Piwanek, 
Dominic Hunter and his brother Sam prepare to butcher a caribou. This is the reality of these people's lives. The meat, fur, and hide from this caribou are an alternative to welfare. It might be unpleasant to look at, but killing animals is central to a decent way of life for the Winnis Cree. There's a place where the bone is soft here. That's where you cut. You make T-bone steaks out of here. There's some sinew over there too. I don't know what to do about the head. I'll just throw it away. But some people eat it. Take out the hair, the fur, and smoke it. Yeah. And make moccasins and mitts. And you can make a snow shoes with it too. And what about the meat now? Where is it going to go? It's going to go to my stomach. <laughs> In fact, Sam Hunter shared that caribou with about four households. That sense of sharing is a good example of how traditional Cree values meet Euro-Canadian ways in Pewanik. This is a Catholic community. One of the new houses was turned into a temporary chapel. In December 86, Cree and English services were held three or four times a week. The community is Catholic, and at times we've had uh, other ministries try to come in. We've had people interested uh, uh, from elsewhere, whether it be uh, Anglican or Pentecost or, or those born-again groups try to come in, and people have always managed to keep them out and, and uh, maintain one religion. And I think it has played a, a big part, uh, uh, and I think it's it's contributed to uh, uh, the social stability of the community. We heard of a guy that came by the name of John the Baptist, came with his candy, all dressed with a nice canoe suit, warm mitts, and he went for a big meal, steak, caribou meat, fish, Potatoes. Is that what we heard? Uh-uh. No? He wild honey. Oh. Yeah. Was he coming with his canoe? Uh -uh. No? Well, I made a mistake. I think my book is not a good one. Because I, in my book here, I thought I read this candy. Well, you're right, Christopher. The man John the Baptist came, and he was preaching in the wilderness. In December, Xavier Wabano died. He was a respected elder. His death was fitting in a way. Piwanek is in the Wabano's hunting territory. Xavier had long favored a move here. He was the first band member to die in the promised land. His funeral was typically informal. Kids rode along on the sleigh that was carrying the casket. Xavier Wabano was comfortable in two worlds. He read his Bible every Sunday, but he taught his son, Michael, about the old ways. I lost, uh, I lost a great deal, I think, because my young man passed away. 
I used to go see him, eh, especially in the springtime. Eh? I used to go see him eh, when the geese are going to arrive and all that. I used to go see him. Eh. What do you think is the weather is going to be like? I used to tell him. Eh? He used to be pretty good at predicting the weather. Eh? Three weeks ago, he told me eh, something is going to happen to us. He said, eh? But he can't tell exactly what he just said. Eh? Something is going to happen. Mm. What he was trying to say was, uh, prepare yourself, eh? Something is going to happen to us again, he said. Eh? Then he died, eh? That's what he meant. But he can't exactly, like, he's not a wizard, eh? But he, has, he had those visions, eh? A long time ago, uh, my people used to believe that somebody came and he said he would come again. So what happened when the missionaries came was that they, they merely reinforced what we believed in. In December, the houses only required finishing touches. But there was still lots of work to do in Pewanek. The Winnis Cree want to build a permanent school church, band office, and a water and sewage system. That last item will be a novelty for a northern reserve, if they get it. It depends on bargaining with the government. Bureaucrats often flew into Pewanek to discuss the project. For Brian Faraday, the work to date is a northern success story. When we started this project, people said, uh, well, September, goose hunt, uh, the, the cynic said, nothing's going to be done, you're going to shut down the operation, uh, nothing will happen at Piwanek. Well, September was one of our busiest months, nobody left the community, nobody went goose hunting, it was build, build, build. Uh, there was a fantastic uh, uh, effort by the, by the community to, uh, to rebuild or to build this new community, so, you know, anything could be done in the north, it's, uh, if the well is there, certainly the well was here at Piwanek. The relocation wasn't entirely painless. There were signs of social problems, problems from which the Winnis Cree seemed almost immune before. George Hunter thinks the people can face the problems with their customary resourcefulness. In looking at the social problem that we've had in the last couple of months, uh, they've been really dramatic. We've had some uh, 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 firearm in, in incidences and uh, property broken. You know, very minimal, but you know, it's it's enough to uh, uh, um, to get people, you know, to, to be uncomfortable about the whole thing because it's something that's never happened in, in our community before and. And, you know, in a sense, a lot of people are very dissatisfied that these things are, are happening. Uh, in terms of the, of the drinking aspect of it, I think it is very, um, uh, very premature. I, I think it would be very premature on my part to, to run to the OPP every time that uh, something has happened. I think uh, we have a dialogue here that as Indian people, you know, Indian to Indian uh, dialogue, you know, that we have. And I think uh, the way I'm going to be dealing with it is talk to people, you know. It, it, it's not required, it's not part of us. Uh, um, I don't think it's the solution to, to, to run to the OPP and say, look, we got a problem, deal with it for us. I think it's, it's going to be more, more realistic and more uh, uh, satisfying to me if I go talk to the people that are creating the problems or that are having the problems. Some families wanted to give up and leave, move to another town. But I think they stayed around. I know I want. I wanted to stay around with my band. Try to <coughs> stay with them, no matter what happens. It's a feeling that you belong somewhere. Like when you're out in North Bay, you don't really know where you belong. Like I always remember wanting to come home. 
And I know a lot of young people, they would always come back home, even if they go out for a year. They'd always want to come back home, because it's, it's, this is home. On the day of the flood, Luke Go was terrified that his kids had drowned. Eight months later, his family enjoys a new life in Piwanek. I have uh, learned like uh, to respect more with my people, you know, and in turn they respect me for help them out and they help me out. I know in fact that we have changed, you know, some negative ways and some in positive ways, you know. Like uh, in positive ways, I would say that every everybody make an effort to help out each other. Anyways, uh, the project is just about all complete. Only the band members will be will be left, and we will try to uh, to correct those uh, negative things. I always try to look on the part of the site that they will be back in home. Seven buildings, only five were left to stand. Gathering at the airport, they began to count the cost. How could they know the two Cree lives were lost? No more in the space of nine months, the Winnis Cree built themselves a new community. Their courage and tenacity. Forever and the home they built are models for the North. But 18 miles of river high on cliffs of timbered land, the one up will rise for the brave we now span. Village of Winnisk, Muskego Cree, people of the North, Nishnabi. Each year they 